Hello, everybody, and Hello. welcome to Coffee Class with Young Screenwriters. Uh, we are an online resource and community for up and coming screenwriters. And today we are getting back to the original roots of Coffee Class, and we are going to break down some scripts. Um, and by some scripts, I mean the pilot of Succession, which is a huge series on HBO right now. Um, and I think that there's a lot to gain from this, whether it's your cup of tea or, or not. There's a lot of really good writing happening. If so. the show makes you too uncomfortable, I'd highly recommend reading um, the uh, script. If it's a very, it's an example of really clean, focused, tight scenes, um, scene writing and dialogue writing. Like you'll, you'll, you, the average succession scene is like a perfect little um, ice sculpture. Remove anything and it falls apart. That was a weird metaphor, but it's like it's very tight and very well considered and like a the, little house of cards. A little there. That's better. That's better. Like the <laughs> if you enter if you enter a little bit later, you leave a little bit earlier. It wouldn't be as high impact. Like they find the perfect moment to come in and then get out. And that's like you could say like just a truism for like great screenwriting is when to know is knowing when to punch in and when to come out. It's like the get in late, get out early thing. But like that's a skill to like recognize in your own writing. Like so often we have this inflated sense of like, well, it's important to show X, Y, and Z, but in retrospect, two drafts later, you realize actually that wasn't that important. Let's start here. And uh, that's hard. And I don't think it's something every, everyone is born. Like you aren't born with that sense. It's an acquired thing you have to force yeah. yourself to recognize, but this show does that very well. And I'd say it's also one of the things that is the like, one of the more like most invisible things that's that you're not going to naturally have a knack for just by knowing how humans work it's like one of those things that's very specific to dramatic storytelling is learning how late you can get in and how early you can get out because we have i know like i do it too i've people have an inclination especially at first to say well i need to have them walk into the room i need to have them do this like i need to have this like i need to build up to this drama I can't just have it start from nowhere. And that's a completely reasonable uh, like belief. Like I understand why we get there. But when you start watching stuff like success Succession, you're like, oh crap, we just, we cut right to it. There's, <laughs> there's no, uh, there's no chit chatting and like entering stage right and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> it's just straight to the drama and it doesn't feel like you're missing things, which I think is a big. Part of it. For sure. And another part of that is, you know, that other basic screenwriting axiom is, um, you know, it's all about conflict and it's all about what people want in conflict, right? And that everybody knows this. Everyone, like, not everyone, everyone who writes screenplays knows this and talks about it constantly, but it's actually rare to some to actually see it done so like transparently. Like there is not a single scene where people who are talking aren't desperately trying to get their agenda across and aren't representing themselves to get that. And they may be doing it with varying levels of skill. Like Greg might be extremely clumsy, but there's a moment where he tries to, in the car with Logan, where he says, well, my grandfather's seat, well, maybe it could be, um, you know, considered that, you know, if somebody younger had it, then maybe um, they could <laughs> offer something to the company. Like he's trying to play the game. He's just doing it terribly because he's a baby. You know, compared to like someone like Logan, who's constantly playing the game constantly. In fact, there are very few lines in this story in this story where Logan is saying what he really thinks. Mm. In the midpoint, when he has the conversation with with Kendall and he tells him what he actually thinks, he says, "You bent over, you know, you bent over and you got fucked, right?" Like, like that that was what he was really thinking before. He says, "Oh yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I'll see you at the party." Like he's mm -hmm. he's listening and he's representing, but he's not actually being true. And there's so much of like. So many, it's actually rare in like young screenplays or I should do screenplays by young writers or beginning writers to have characters who are misrepresenting themselves constantly or where there's like a dissonance between what they're trying, what they're expressing and what they really want. Mm -hmm. And this is constant. Um, I actually think the characters who are not good at navigating this world are the people who are more easy to read. Like Tom is mm. such a sycophant and he's such a, He's just trying so hard. Yeah, but he's he's so bad at the game, you know. <laughs> he's terrible at it. Yeah, that Which was is a kind great, of like, great impression. 
<laughs> <laughs> Adam is Greg. Surprise, yeah, he, surprise. Jesus. Um, <laughs> it's worth saying, the, like, the, talking briefly about the origins of this, because I think it's just relevant, but I, and I think it's interesting. Isn't it based on the uh, Murdochs? Murdoch family. Yes. Yeah, so this is, a, you could say, a sh this is kind of like what the master did to L. Ron Hubbard. It's basically L. Ron, that was basically L. Ron Hubbard's story, but they changed his name and the name of the thing. This is the Murdoch family, but they're the Roys. Instead of Fox, it's Waystarco. It's like, and you, yeah, they even have like the same, uh, you know, there's in real life, there's James and the, the and then Logan. James is the older, uh, you know, it, yeah, it's the same thing, you know. There's the there's the heir apparent who has his shit together, and there's the young crazy one. They they play it up for TV, and I would say that these characters are different and unique in their own way. But like, it's clear that that was like a one to one in in the pitch where they were like, okay, it's gonna be basically the Murdochs. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, like I imagine that's how it was pitched. Like they didn't, 100%. you know, they definitely came in. They said we gotta do something about the Murdochs, and it's gonna be great. Um, so I think that that's that, that's something that gets brought up a lot. Um, is people asking questions about like, what can you do? Like, can you tell, like, how do you get permission to tell the Murdoch story? How do you do blah, 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 blah. They were not going to get the Murdoch's permission to tell no the story. No way they were. <laughs> <laughs> so they just do like one step to the left and then do whatever they want. So, and like Adam said, that other one, the master, it's, uh, it's something to consider when you're thinking about taking inspiration from real life is how much does it matter to you that it is explicitly the person you're basing it on or explicitly that circumstance and how much is it just that you want to tell the story and you know people who get it will get it i i actually think that a lot of the there have been some films about fox news recently there was one called bombshell i think mm -hmm. um which was about the um you know, the CEO who got yeah, sexual assault or, you know, he got fired. And there was a whole story about it. It was going through photographic deal detail of like, oh, what happened? What happened? It's way less interesting than using the situation and family or environment as a jumping off point. You know, like if The Master was a film actually about L. Ron Hubbard, it probably would have been less interesting because they would have felt been constrained by actually the things that happened rather than trying to evoke the tone and feeling of things that happened but like be in control like the problem with being making a biography biographical film is that you have to you can't just make shit up <laughs> yeah that'll be good for the story so you have to actually listen to history um yeah to a degree i'll say though that like things yeah, yeah, like sure. um but i mean like when they don't then there's a lot of controversy like the blind side is one where yeah. They they misrepresented uh, main character whose name I can't remember right now, but they misrepresented his story to like a pretty like important degree. Like he had not never played football; he was already playing football. It's like this lady. They, didn't it's tell what him people to play called uh, they Holly they Hollywoodified it. Yeah, which basically means to phonally compress it into three act structure and storytelling conventions. Um, mm -hmm. Even if it doesn't fit, or even if it's like means changing the entire character altogether, um, yeah, you know. So, do you want to do a breakdown of the pilot? Do a really months? fast breakdown because cool. I want to actually look into the script uh, and talk about okay. some of these great scenes because that's what's awesome about it. All right, so <clears throat> this succession pilot opens. The teaser cold open is Logan Roy completely awake in the darkness. He's super vulnerable. He doesn't know where he is. He gets out of bed. He urinates on the rug. And he's, this is a moment where we introduce him where he's completely vulnerable. And it's an interesting jumping off point for the rest of the show where he is the one in power. We see him sort of embracing his old age, not embracing, but like struggling with his old age and maybe the reality of that. We cut from him urinating on the rug to his son, Kendall Roy, hyping himself up in a, a limo or in a car on the way to work, listening to the Beastie Boys. And <laughs> his driver tells him, you're the man, Mr. Roy, you're the man. And we are introduced uh, into the main act one uh, problem, which is, you know, Kendall Roy crashing into a meeting. He's trying to close this deal, this acquisition of the smaller internet company. 
but he is super clumsy. He opens the meeting saying, you ready to fuck or what? You know, he's unprofessional using like really like, you know, jarring metaphors to sort of like aggressively get what he wants, like, and almost kind of with a, a very unsavvy business sense. He's just trying to like increase the amount of money because he, he clearly believes that no matter how much money I, he offers to the small company, like if it's the right number, he can buy them. And <laughs> He says, oh, this great line is, oh, you want me to send a vintage Jaguar over to your house today? And, you know, at the end, when they're on the way out of the meeting, the guy basically sells, tells him, I'm not going to let you Neanderthals destroy my company. You're daddy's boy. And it's not going to work out. <laughs> and even then, Kendall can't accept that. He's like saying, uh, "Do you what, what do I need to sweeten the offer? <laughs> Afterwards, when he's doing a post-mortem with his people, they're like, he's like, what just happened? What just happened? They're like, do you need to call your dad? And he answers at the great, why would I call my dad? Does anyone want to call their dads? Do you want to call your dad? And, you know, it's so clear that, you know, he's not really in charge yet. He's trying to present more power and more influence than he really has. Because when things go wrong, everybody around him is like, well, what does Logan Roy think? Um, and he basically says, I'm going to pu push the deal to 120. Um, from this point, we sort of get a sense of Logan. So we get a sense of Logan's power, even if we haven't really met him in action yet. We get a sense of Kendall, who is the protagonist of this episode, um, his flaw, and his big unmet desire. His unmet desire to in life right now is to succeed his father's position as head of Waystar, uh, Waystar Royco. And we introduce the normal world of this uh, of Kendall, which is, he believes he's the successor. The status quo is he's going to make it. He's he's the chosen one. He's going to take the mantle on for daddy. But the setting and normal world of the show, the cutthroat political uh, ladder of the company and the family's dysfunction. Everything that happens in the show is the family dynamic and the company dynamic. It's a ladder, stab people in the back. It's a Game of Thrones with the throne being the chairman position. We also uh, introduce the uh, B plot of the episode, which is Greg, the oh, he's the nephew or the great nephew of Logan, um, or no cousin. He's a cousin. Yeah, that's right. He's a cousin of the family. He's smoking in the car before an orientation film plays about uh, Waystar Royco. He's a mascot, and it's an interesting angle. We sort of see we've seen the chair, we've seen the inner circle, and now we see you know, the bottom of the ladder. We've seen, we see both sides of the uh, universe of Waystar um, Royco. And he vomits in the job and he gets fired because he was smoking a joint in his car. And we see him on the phone, talk to his mom and his mom sort of says, hey, you could ask for your job back. Why don't you get in touch with uh, um, Logan who, you know, your grandfather's brother, he can check you up with a job. So that's the one B stuff, the B plot that plays throughout the episode of Greg trying to get a job at his um, great uncle's company. We meet Roman, who uh, who is uh, the younger brother, who's very chaotic and does not have his life together. He crashes Kendall's meeting, and he asks him about the de deal. It seems like everybody in this world knows about the deal, um, and he sort of laughs, but he's sort of fishing for information about how much he's bidding. When he tells him 120, he laughs. And it's like, holy crap, you're doing, really? Okay, whatever, you're in charge, you're in charge. But clearly he has a lot of, this is a sort of seating that nothing is really a secret here and that everybody's eyes are on Kendall. There's a lot of pressure for him to close this deal in a position of power and he's clearly losing it already. <laughs> and he ends the scene by saying, every intern on the street knows you're stepping up. But then he immediately undercuts that moment of like, oh, you can do it with, look at all this bullshit, you in the suit, me, whatever. And he le leaves. Um, <laughs> I don't know what's next. Uh, oh yeah, and then we cut to Logan at his sort of uh, prepping for the birthday party. He's alone in the house, um, sort of watching everybody, all his like uh, staff preparing, uh, you know, food, cleaning the apartment. He seems very sort of disconnected. He's something's weighing on his mind until he sees uh, the, uh, a copy of Forbes with his son's face on it and he throws it down. Clearly that's going to be a uh, factor later. We meet Shiv and Tom who are, uh, this I would say is the C plot is Tom trying to give away this gift to um, Logan. 
and he they had, we immediately get a sense of Shiv and Tom and their dynamic. You know, she's like, "What the heck is a prekend?" And Tom's like, "A prekend is a Thursday afternoon and Friday." <laughs> so he's like this guy who's like really likes to be in the line. He likes his systems. He really trusts like process, and he very much um, <laughs> cares about how he's seen and cares about social norms. But basically, he agonizes over a gift about like, "I want to give him a gift that like will make him." respect me but like i will they'll make him like me before i know i can love him <laughs> this is like really sort of tells you a lot about his headspace and shiv tells him this great anything will be fine because anything will be nothing just make sure it's 10 to 15 grand worth and you're good <laughs> so that uh, 10 to 15 grand gift is going to be like the subplot tom trying to give uh is the c plot i should say him trying to give away the um gift to logan and we enter the what I think is the inciting incident, which is very, for this episode, the inciting incident is, uh, well, first of all, there's the series inciting incident, which is different than this small episode inciting incident. The inc episode inciting incident is Logan basically crashes uh, Kendall's meeting. Kendall is, you know, he's trying to, he's dealing with like, like how the counter offer, the acquisition, how they can close. And he starts using all this profanity. He'll be like, what, I'll even cup his balls. He doesn't know that Logan's standing right behind him, sort of like judging him, being like, Is this really how you're going to be running the co company? Really? Um, and basically, <laughs> he has this manila, manila envelope in his hand. And he's sort of like uh, nonchalantly pre presenting it, but he gets uh, Kendall to sign it. Be like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to add Marsha, my wife, to the will, to the trust. Don't worry about it, just small, small stuff. And Kendall doesn't even read it. He's so frazzled that his dad is here and was sort of like, is everything okay? Is the transition going to happen? Are we good? He just signs it without even thinking. This, I think, is um, the inciting incident of the episode because it's sort of, it's the, the trust document that is going to put all of the succession, <laughs> title of the show, into question. It's going to put Kendall's... Uh, you know, stepping into uh, his father's seat, it's going to totally mess mess up the status quo of the world. Normal world is Kendall's in control. He's going to be the, the successor to mm, something's going to mess this all up. Um, and I, at the end of Act One, we clearly have a sense of his objective. He wants to get this de this acquisition done. He needs to acquire this company. So Act Two is sort of a preamble. Uh, starts with sort of like you know, sequence of events at the birthday party. Logan's birthday party is about to happen. Logan hands a manila envelope to Marcia, his wife, as everyone greets him. He doesn't want a surprise. He's trying to like make this go as quickly as possible. He seems to very much not care about social niceties. He doesn't care about, you know, typical indicators of family. His love language is business and acquiring wealth and demeaning others who don't. And it's very clear that, you know, all of the social niceties around, like, you know, birthday parties and getting older and telling your kids you love them don't really matter to him. He meets Greg on the staircase before um, the birthday party. And Greg sort of introduces himself to Logan to get access to the party. He's accidentally uh, introduced as Craig. Um, and then we see Tom prostrating himself, trying to give the gift to him, but he can't give the gift. He keeps being undercut by, you know, uh, other people with their gifts. Shiv is trying to upsell Logan as Tom. Uh, sorry, she's trying to upsell Tom, her husband, for the for uh, to run the parks department. Uh, everybody's trying to get something from Logan, and he's just trying to sort of move on. He's something got something heavier on his plate that he wants to deal with. When Kendall comes to the birthday party, Logan looks at him with sort of this sort of like, "Are you really here right now?" Um, <laughs> And uh, he asks him about the deal, and he says, it's fine, it's fine. I might have to dip out for a moment. Don't worry about it. Um, we meet Kendall's children, his ex-wife. And it's very clear he wants to get back with his ex-wife. But um, <laughs> you ask her, are you seeing someone? She says, yeah, I am. And I hope this one doesn't leave Coke smeared over the kids' iPads. It tells you that Kendall recently had a drug problem. He's trying to get over He's got problems. But she ends very socially nicely saying, you deserve this. Seriously, after everything you've been through. And Logan lets everybody know he has an announcement he's going to make in the living room. 
the midpoint of the episode is huge disruption. Logan announces he's adding Marcy to the family trust and that uh, he's giving her his, her seat on the board at his death. But that means giving double voting weight. Kendall didn't read the small print. Obviously, another sign in Logan's eyes that he's not ready for leadership. And all the children sort of grapple with, well, what are we going to do? Are we going to support this? Are you really leaving? What does this mean? What does it mean that she's going to be a part of the board? What is this family dynamic shift? And he tells them all, I'm going to give it a couple of years as chairman, head of the firm. I'm not, I'm going to stay on, which totally disrupts um, Kendall's plans. <laughs> and when he asks him about it, are you sure? What, what do you mean by this? He says, I just said something, or are you not listening again? It's brutal stuff. It's really good. And uh, I love that the old, the eldest son, Connor, he uh, refuses to engage. He's like, whatever you guys decide, I'll, I'll vote with. Um, but Kendall clearly is losing control of a both the status quo, his plan, he's going to be the successor, but also uh, Shiv and Roman, his younger siblings. Uh, he doesn't seem to be able to control them. He needs to get them on his side to keep power and get this deal through. So this following scene immediately after, which is almost like a two-part midpoint beat, like there are two scenes that really define the midpoint, this immediate revelation of, oh, I'm not leaving, and then the aftermath scene where you know, Kendall and uh, Logan are, Kendall confronts Logan in the dining room. He says, I, it feels like you fucked me. Um, and Logan basically tells him, I'm concerned you might be soft. And he tells him, I hear you bent over for him. And he fucked you regarding the deal earlier on, earlier on and him trying to uh, keep increasing the bids, keep increasing the bids no matter the cost. And there's this group, so many great lines, but the first one that I think is really representative is Kendall's like, some, you know, this isn't a big dick competition. And Logan says, sometimes it is a big dick competition. And he chastises him for leaving to come to the birthday party. He says, you left the room, the deal. You could sort of get the sense that, you know, the fact, the final nail in the coffin for this uh, choice was that Kendall actually showed up to his birthday party and, you know, gave that traditional indicator of love. They're like, oh, I'm going to show to my father's birthday party. Logan would have preferred him to stay and actually do the deal, actually do his job, actually be competent. <laughs> and this brutal part, Kendall starts to cry, and he says, are you fucking crying? And Kendall leaves, trashes the bathroom. He seems to have totally be losing control. And this is halfway point of the episode, a little bit after, and it seems like everything after this moment is sort of repercussions, sort of Kendall trying to desperately get control where he's losing it. Um, and at the dinner... There's this great moment where Logan's longtime COO, Frank, gives a, you know, this meaningful speech about how, you know, he's been with the family for 30 years and how, you know, he toasts Logan and, you know, to all of, uh, you know, their their legacy together. Um, you know, Logan just sort of nods his head and is like, okay, yeah, 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 whatever. But he brings up this idea like, oh, let's all play the game, all the game together, the whole family they get on their helicopters, their cars, they go off to this um, little soccer field outside of uh, the city. And on the way there, Greg, <laughs> in the B-plot with Greg, he's, as he gets a ride with Logan and Marcia, and he's sort of brings up his grandfather's seat as leverage, you know, to maybe get a job at the apart at the uh, company. You know, he's trying to play the game, but he's terrible at playing the game. Uh, like uh, I mentioned earlier, it's a great scene. Um, Tom sits, you know, there with his gift. He still hasn't given his gift uh, to Logan, agonizing over it. So that's the C plot. B plot is Greg. C plot is um, Tom trying to get his gift away. Um, in the helicopter ride, Logan makes a quid pro quo with Roman, sort of get him to agree to signing the trust document. He basically says, Yes, uh, get rid of Frank, that guy who just gave that speech for you. You worked together for 30 years. Get rid of him. I want his job. I want to be COO. And he's like, all right, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and back when they land, um, Logan's trying to get Shiv on his side, and she basically is like, give Tom Tom's boss's uh, job. And Tom finally approaches, and he gives the gift over to... Um, <laughs> Logan and he makes this joke about like you know every time you look at it you can see how rich you are and Logan says did you rehearse that 
And Tom says, no, yes, yes, I did. Yeah. <laughs> the way he completely undercuts himself. He's such a deeply insecure, phony, uh, what's the word? Operative, you know, but it's, it's, it's great. Um, and sort of act three sort of plays out just sort of in this uh, soccer field and in transit back. Um, uh, Kendall, before he leaves back to go to the city to close the deal, he's always in and out of conversations. You can tell he's not really committed to being any one place, which is huge colossal mistake in retrospect, but he's trying to salvage, uh, you know, getting Shiv and Roman on his side. We'll all vote together. And Roman says, fuck you, walks away. <laughs> and um, Tom threatens Greg with another great phony scene. He's, he's like, if you need any help, don't worry about it. But don't fucking bother. I'm joking. And he says, like, would you kiss me if I told you to? Just joking, just joking. He's like trying to like, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you kick the cat, the cat kicks, kicks the mouse, the mouse kicks the fly. It's sort of like, um, that's a weird metaphor. But, you know, it's like Tom feels like he doesn't have any power to lash out at the only person there who's below him. Um, <laughs> Kendall leaves and they need an extra person to play. So they get a kid for one of the um, staff's uh, staff families. And Roman tells the kid that he's going to give him a million dollars if he can hit a home run and their little gang. And he fails. And Roman, just in terrible taste, just starts laughing at, uh, you know, the whole situation. Like, haha, I've just got so much money. I've got more money than God. Who cares? He's so wrong for any position of leadership. It's a great contrast to the scene right before where Logan was like, yeah, I'll make you COO if you sign this document. This guy? <laughs> it's, it's, it's great that those scenes were so close to each other. Um, and Frank, uh, Logan goes over to Frank and he basically fires him after all those years. And Frank is pissed. And you could see the way Logan's mind sort of operates. He says, don't worry, you'll get your nut. And walks away. And in the helicopter ride back, Logan tries to secure Roman, Connor, and Shiv's support, and but they counter offer him like, well, actually, you know, it's maybe not enough. Maybe I want more than being a COO. And this trigger, he has a brain hemorrhage, and they have to go to uh, the hospital. So the helicopter diverts, and everything's in chaos. And there's this awesome scene right at the end where, before Kendall knows about the hemorrhage, Lawrence, the guy who was, he was, uh, you know trying to get the acquisition from earlier, tells Kendall, hey, we have a deal. Yeah, great. Oh, second thing, your, Brad, your dad had brain hemorrhage. Um, and you just invited me to the chicken coop. And without your daddy there to protect you, I'm going to eat you all one by one. So Kendall got what he wanted, the deal. deal. But he's paid more than he probably wished, wished to. He's given this guy every assurance, all board seat, I believe, all of this power, and it's going to bite him in the butt. And later in the season, we're going to see the fallout of the decision. Um, Kendall's place as Logan's successor is completely in question. Logan's health is in question. Roman, Paul, Shiv's involvement is in question. And this sort of ends all, it's a great dramatic question. Who is going to be the, the head dog? Who's going to be the chairman? Who's going to have power? It's kind of like uh, if this was Game of Thrones, who's gonna sit on the Iron Throne? who's going to lead Ray, Waystar Roy Co. And it's pretty clear that it's any one of these family members, they're all going to be cutting each other's throats, undercutting each other, misrepresenting themselves, playing this game in this family and at this company. And it's the new world of the show. The new world that every other episode of this show is going to represent that dynamic. And it's so important for a pilot to represent that. And they did such a good job, even in the last 15 minutes of this episode, really shows the dynamic that's going to sell the rest of the show. And that was my really clumsy breakdown. Oh, good job. So I think, yeah, I think that that, let's see. We have some cool conversations happening in the chat. Yeah, I was not reading I any like of that. Bring up. Yeah, I figured I, I can't either while I'm talking. But um, so there was a question about here. Is Kendall the protagonist of the first season only or the whole show? Um. I think, I think there are multiple like characters who you could label as protagonists. I think the way this type of show is best defined 
is each episode has its own protagonist. And all that basically means yeah. is they are the character with the A plot in the story. So in television, there's A plots, B plots, C plots, sometimes D plots. Sometimes just an A and a B plot. But, um, and very rarely it's an A plot. And that's not a conventional episode of television. It's very rare when that happens. But basically it's like the other plot line that we're pursuing. And the A plot is the largest one. So, and I would also define it as being the character with the main objective in the episode. So like in this yes. episode, Kendall was the protagonist because he was trying to close the deal. Yeah. And he spent his whole episode trying to close the deal. Yeah, I would agree. And then I would, so then the question about the season, there isn't a protagonist in the same sense that you would see in a movie because you are going to get different protagonists per episode. It's going to depend on the actual episode itself. But I would consider Kendall the protagonist of the season. I haven't seen it, but my understanding is that we gave Kendall the inciting incident, mostly Kendall, yes. the inciting incident of the, it disrupts of the season. His normal world. Yeah. He was expecting to get to take over, and then now he's not. Um, and the dad is all, like, basically, someone's going to have to take over. That's very, very clear. Kendall thought it was going to be him but it's not. And I know that we're building towards an attempted, at least, I don't know how it goes, but towards like a takeover, basically. Eventually Kendall's gonna, is taking it to that point, is the loose plot. And so because of that, that kind of makes, that makes Kendall the central arc of the entire season. But again, it doesn't necessarily play out in the same way that a movie does. Like where every single episode is about him. Each episode can have its own protagonist and we can go into other people's lives, but it is, um, it's, he kind of, his journey is what kept us, is like what anchors us from beginning to end is the thing that happened here and what will happen in the season finale. I think that later seasons really open up to more characters. Like we really sense, we get a sense of Roman's vulnerabilities later on. We get a sense of Paul's vulnerabilities, Shiv's vulnerabilities. And I think there are some episodes that like, oh, this is Paul's episode. Sorry, Tom. Why do you keep saying Paul? Tom's episode. He looks like a Paul. <laughs> mm. At the end of the season, Kendall makes a decisive action. The last half of the episode is about him only, right? Yeah. So this season, I think, focuses on Kendall more than later seasons. Yeah. And it's it's helpful to think of it like that so that you make sure that you still have a singular specific goal um, or driving towards. It gives your story a direction to go by choosing a protagonist, even if you are going to spend time with a ton of other characters and give other people episodes to be the protagonist of having someone that you identify narratively as the protagonist of the season helps to make sure that you're always moving towards something so that your story is actually going somewhere and you have things to make choices about and actions and all of that. Um, here's another fun question. Um, how do the writers succeed in making us sympathize with such terrible people? Unless so, that's just me and I'm psychotic. <laughs> I have an answer for that. Um, I think the word is empathize, right? It's not so much sympathize. Like, I always confuse will, them. Or, right, but it is different. And yeah. I think from a writer's point of view, you have to understand the emotional truth of all your characters, even if they're psychopaths. Like you have to understand why somebody does something and what their damage is and... You have to empathize with them. Even if you're writing a serial killer, you have to empathize with like, and under, not so much to sympathize because you can be like, well, I would judge this person in life, but as, as I'm writing them, I have to understand them. And by doing that, you'll create that effect in your stories, right? Like the key is to making, if your protagonists or if your core cast of characters are all terrible people, you have to show us, okay, what do they want more than anything? What's in the way? What is, how are they being self-destructive? And by showing that, but like showing that Kendall is trying to get something and he can't have it to show his struggle, to show his pain. It just, it's a weird effect that just watching people in pain, watching people try to get things, try watching people be misunderstood, watching people struggle. It creates empathy, even if they're terrible. It's really interesting. And I would say the characters who people don't bond with are the people who we don't understand. 
Like yeah. in Game of Thrones, nobody empathized with Joffrey. No. Or very. But if we got, to see, but like in the books, I remember that he actually had like pretty like. It, his like childhood wasn't great and kind of I mean I yes. think he was also like he was shaped into the person that he was through like a different through a but series there was of no events. point of view character like there, he was never a point yeah. of view character like, we were never in his head knowing what he yeah. was thinking like and Tyrion if you just look at the things he did if he wasn't a point of view point of view character people wouldn't have like cared about him as much mm -hmm. yeah exactly I would agree with that and I think that something else that helps here is that even in this first episode, um, characters have two ways of interacting with the world. And we see them both. They're not one note. We see Kendall when he's trying to be the cool guy. And then we see Kendall when he's just like desperate for his dad's affirmation. Like we see both of those things. And so it helps us... I think create the feeling that we know them more. Like we get we get the insight into what how people are like behind closed doors and a little bit of their vulnerability. I think we get to see the vulnerable side of most of the characters. I mean, like we basically open with Logan struggling with his health at the very beginning. We yeah, see which him is extremely super extremely vulnerable. Yeah. And then he's a dick for the rest of the movie. Or not the movie. He's a dick for a lot of the rest of the show. But he like... But we still have that from before. And we kind of understand what's going on. And he ends up covering up. He just kind of refuses to participate a lot. Until he finally decides like, you know what? I'm just gonna... I'm gonna be a jerk right now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it how it is. So we see him frequently holding back. And we get the feeling... That he's holding back like when kendall told him about the money about raising the bid and he was just silent we're like "Ooh, that's not good um but he didn't push it yet it was kind of like we got to see him building up to the point of being pushed and that let us understand more if he came out swinging like you stupid idiot da -da 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 -da, at the very first time yeah. that Kendall said that, or if he had said the things to Kendall for the first call, like if he said the things he said at Kendall to the end at the first call, it wouldn't have the same impact because we would be setting his like, we'd be setting different expectations for the character. It's, the other thing that, that that accomplishes him peeing in the beginning, <laughs> if we lost that scene and we played it the same way, the first mention of him is like, oh, your father, you know, your father, are you going to call him? He seems like a big imposing figure. Mm -hmm. The contrast between seeing this old man and his vulnerability, losing his grip on where he is and being, you know, alone and isolated with, you know, his power in the organization. And the, like when he walks into the room with an envelope, it's a big deal and everyone caters to him. Like if we just got him being hyped up, it wouldn't have it wouldn't have been as much of a surprise for him to undercut Kendall in the midpoint. Yeah. And I think it also accomplishes the feeling of like, it gives some validity to the kids, to Kendall's claim, especially that he's not necessarily in good enough health to run the company. Like it lays the seed for the fact that that is a legitimate thing that we're, that we're coming up against now where he's not healthy and it sets up so that the brain hemorrhage at the end isn't out of left field or else that might feel completely too shocking. Like it's believable because we understood that he's also um, struggling with his health. So it, it lays the foundation and it also gives some credence to the kids objections. Um, and it also kind of is like a, the gun under the table, whatever it is. Um, we know that this is a real thing for him that's a big deal and that it's gonna be a problem eventually um what did you think of the religious symbolism throughout the show i didn't pick uh, up on it i didn't pick up on it i'd be curious then again i'm you... i'm a raging atheist so you know <laughs> I, I don't i'm sorry raging is probably the wrong word yeah but um <laughs> but that may, I'm, maybe on rewatch if i rewatch the whole series maybe i'll pick up something more 
I'm curious what you mean. I'd be I'd be interested to know more. Also, religion. It depends what religion you're talking about because like religions. To, to a totally secular point of view is if you look at like, you know, all of main religious texts, they all have archetypal human stories in them. And you can see those imprints in all other stories. So you could argue that, you know, religious stories have an imprint in, on everything, um, whether it's conscious or not. I don't know if it was conscious on the writer's part. Um, raging <laughs> atheist. No, no, not raging. I'm, I'm what no. I am is I'm an agnostic atheist in the sense of like, I don't know if there's no God, but I'm not going to believe in one until, I have reason to, and I have absolutely no problem with other people's religious beliefs. I'm not evangelical in any sense. Like I don't want to convert anybody. It's just a personal position. Um, not to be you know, I would discussed it. I would say he's not raging. I would say that. <laughs> I, I have no problem it. with uh, other people's beliefs. I don't really care. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, oh, the Judas kiss. I mean, yeah, maybe that was a conscious thing. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I'll go back to that maxims in a second. Um, the Judas kicks kiss. Yeah, that's cool. That's interesting. Um, so, I would say, um, I don't think his flaw is, is, is his addiction. Um, I like in terms of the sense of like dramatic flaw, his dramatic flaw is, I would argue it's his, it's his need to, be <laughs> it's his belief that he will gain his father's love by being competent enough in his world like his belief that he needs to be succeed in his father's world that's my that's what i believe his fly is because it's what creates the most dramatic conflict and it's so and it's self-destructive his addiction might be um a manifestation of that like a coping mechanism for mm -hmm. his inability to be his father. Yeah. Because I think his Kendall's much more sensitive than his father is. He had, none of none of none of Logan's children, except maybe Shiv, is actually like Logan. And I think that's so much of like they all want to make him proud. They're all trying to do it in the ways, but they're reaching their their in a, their um they're each reaching their limitations. Like there's a you they you know you rise to your level of incompetence. Um, every time uh, Roman has an opportunity, he fucks it up. Every time Logan has an opportunity, he messes it up. And honestly, Sh Shiv makes her own mistakes. I think she's she's the most like rogue, like Logan in the sense of like competency. I think it's also so talking about flaw and things like that. This is one of those times where I think it's good to to talk about how flaw is a. Um, a belief like is a is a belief that the character holds and it's one that is detrimental to them and doesn't let them achieve their inner need right yeah. so it flaw is negatively charged but it doesn't always have to actually be a belief that we would morally judge as bad it's just something that drives the character's actions that's a that's a belief that is preventing them from being like self-actualized or happy and getting their objective yeah. and things like that um so in this case kendall his flaw is some if we would normally try to find a way to define his flaw as like a statement something like what adam said like um i will be worthy of my dad's love if i succeed or whatever like that right if I if I'm like perfect, I will be worthy of my dad's love. And my understanding is that the way that this show is building is that in the last episode, it seems like he like has a breakdown with his dad and his dad's comforting him. And so I would say that it has to do with it's a little complicated because Logan has his own flaws too. I would say it has to do with like being willing to be vulnerable around the dad, especially because in this first scene in this first episode we have that scene where kendall where he's like do you, you want to hit me you want to take a swing at me like hit me are you going to cry are you going to cry about it kendall and he doesn't he's not crying about it <laughs> he's just standing there he's mad and he's refusing to to show that like he is projecting that vulnerability but he's refusing to actually cry and then the fact that at the end he has a breakdown in his dad's arms that i think kind of shows his character path um you, no 
So this is a good question mark. Um, is the character aware up front that their belief is a flaw? No. It's invisible. Usually not. Yeah, it's invisible to them. Um, they might know pieces of it. Usually they'll know the things that kind of grow out of the flaw or problems. For example, I would say addiction for Kendall is one of the the consequences that makes his life harder that grows out of his flaw, right? Like it's related, but that's not the flaw itself. That's just like the things that happen. There's a lot of choices he makes that are because of his flaw. Um, and they might be aware of those choices being bad, but usually they're not aware of this like inner conflict life. Because if they were, then there wouldn't be a show, right? Like if, yeah. if, if the, if the drama could be solved by, a little bit of self-awareness, it wouldn't be powerful, uh, a potent combination to create lasting drama. Like it has to be something that defines who he is and his choices. So the, the way I would define a flaw, it's a lie the protagonist tells themselves that they genuinely believe that defines the main choices they make in the story. Like his flaw about who he is and what he is to his dad and what he wants in life is like why he makes choices. It's like an important thing that defines it. And it's like, it's like the mistake people make is they just make flaw like a negative characteristic. Oh yeah, he's just selfish. No, 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 no. How is that specific to this story? What belief defines them? Why are they making choices because of their selfishness? Like actually going deep mm -hmm. about what the dramatic flaw, when we say flaw, we mean dramatic flaw, like Alexi was saying. Um, yeah, I would say that also circles back to what Martin was saying about how do you create empathy for these characters that are terrible. And it's, it's when the writer, because you could do Kendall's flaw is selfish or something like that. You could do that and then say, like, he needs to learn to be more selfless. And if you leave it at that level, there's no room to empathize with someone who's selfish. Yeah. Right? If all I know about this person is they're selfish, then my response is, don't be selfish then. Like, stop being selfish. But if his flaw is that, like my self-worth is completely derived by my dad's approval. That kind of thing. And that motivates selfish behavior and things like that. I can empathize with that core narrative flaw. I might not like the choices that they make, but I can empathize with that core narrative flaw. And that makes me at least understand why they do what they do, um, even if I don't agree with it. And I think that goes a big way towards making him... So making all these characters who are pretty deeply unlikable, someone who we want to watch. And they all have them. They all have a need for love and a need for acceptance and a bad way of going about it. And that's what creates the drama. And that's what makes it interesting. Um, the, just going up a little bit, getting love from his daddy would be his inner need then? Uh, no, because that wouldn't be like an internal change in belief. Like, that would, would just be, like be like winning his flaw. <laughs> that would, that you would know. be winning his flaw, right? Yeah. His inner need would be a, a version of his inner need because if the inner need, if he accepts his inner need, the show is over um, because TV needs to draw out that flaw, conflict, inner play as much as long as possible. But his, his an inner need hypothetically could be, you know, I don't need my father's love to be happy. I'm yeah. going to step away. I'm going to be my own person. Like that would be an inner need. And then the show would end. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and that, to go back to this point, do you think there will ever be a resolution to Kendall's arc? Because he seems to be coming back to the same point and repeating the same mistakes. How long can the creators keep this going? So that's good a question. good question. That's a good question. Because, so like what Adam was saying, with in, in movies, you will have a flaw at the beginning that is resolved by the end and the character can obtain their inner need. That is how that's how movies go, and that is again to, to push back on like all the inevitable points of it. That can be that their flaw was something that we consider morally good, and they like descend into darkness. It just means that they are getting closer to their secret need by the end of the thing. They go through complete transformation. They change as people and as characters throughout the course of the story. TV isn't like that unless unless it's a limited series, in which case it can accomplish that kind of a thing over time. But generally, if it's a TV show that is intended to go on and on and on, you can't have them 
have this really like acute arc. Instead, it's a really gentle slope towards this thing. It has a lot of up and downs. Um, sometimes you'll see it done where they have like a mini flaw of the episode, or not the episode of the of the season, like where they keep changing a little bit, but not fully. Uh, and it's I would say it's a dance to be careful and make sure that you're not just getting annoying because we do want to see some change. We yeah, want to see incremental change though. Yeah, we want to see them progressing. Um, as audience members, it's frustrating to watch someone make the same mistake again and again and again. So it's, like it's a, about a house is a great example of this, right? Like people got really tired of by the end of that show of like, okay, yes, yeah, stop it with your Vicodin addiction and your leg. I don't care anymore. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like they needed some, th so you need to find ways to keep it interesting or to push it further or to like delve deeper into, into your psyche. I don't know. I'd be curious if like, I'd be interested in seeing a version of this show or a version of this character. I'm not even going to say this show because it's not appropriate to it. But like where at the end of the first season, he realizes he doesn't need his dad's approval to be happy. And then the next one is him trying to figure out what he does need to be happy and like trying wrong things, kind of a thing like that. Like moving it along, but still about a, like a related thing. It's sometimes how it's done. Anyway. Uh, I also, no spoilers for season three or season two. We're, we're just going to keep it light on I spoilers. I can't, because I don't know. Lexi hasn't <laughs> seen it either, so there you go. Um, I can only talk about the pilot. I have, and, and season then, three is yeah. awesome. I could say they keep, their, it's it's great right now. It's up for the, It's up to them to mess it up. Interesting. Which happens all the time. <laughs> I need to decide if I'm going to keep watching it. It's, the... I don't know, if, if you don't get like some form of satisfaction out of it, then I don't think it's, it's like more of the same. Yeah. It's just really good. Like it's not going to be a game changer for you. If you, if you aren't like happy with the experience of watching the show, don't yeah. bother. Yeah. It's one of those things where I can tell that it's quality writing, but my discomfort outweighs my, like yeah. the, the entertainment I derive just because it's so it's the kind of tension that that does that to me. Um, and but, it's uncomfortable because it's so real, right? It's sort of like, yeah. oh my God, these are the assholes running the world. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's a, it's a dark, it's a dark truth there. Um, so here's Mark's follow-up question. So what the character believes is a result of their being selfish. I would say it's flipped. Them being yeah. selfish is a result of what they believe. So like yes, what they the belief is the core. Like it's it yeah. starts at the belief and everything else is like a consequence of the belief. Mm -hmm. Simple. Yep. And uh you'll see this in real life with people. They have one thing that is that you can empathize with that drives a bunch of the actions that you hate. And uh that's what therapy's for, party people. Uh also the secret to empathy <laughs> is watching people struggle earnestly with this dynamic right like if we show someone earnest belief and like how it's messing them up and seeing them get messed up like seeing a character really get kicked and struggle and try to make things better is the easiest way to get us to care about them like mm. immediately you like you're rooting for greg immediately because he's like working yeah. this terrible mascot job he's so disconnected he's he's he doesn't know how to articulate himself. He's in over his head, trying to make it work, but is just ill-equipped. Like that just makes them more interesting in some ways. Or not more interesting, but like you care about them. Yeah. And in fact, I think Paul, we care about, sorry, I keep saying Paul, Tom. Who's Paul? Uh, why do I keep saying Paul? <laughs> is that the actor's name? I don't know. Uh, no, his name's Matthew McFadden. Okay. He was in Pride and Prejudice. He was Darcy. Who knew? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I, I think for Flaw and Her Need, keep it really simple and powerful. Like, you can have it be simple and shallow, go simple and deep. Yeah. So like, I want my father, I want, to, I want my father's, I will win my father's love if I can be like him, is a flaw. It's a simple yeah. idea that can define every choice they make. And if it's incompatible with who they are, it's you're just going to create drama, oceans of drama. In fact, I would say 
all of the children grapple with different versions of that idea. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what gives it like a unifying theme of the show. Even though it yeah. doesn't feel redundant, it's like all slightly different takes on that that make it manifest differently, but it's all getting at the same issue, which is really interesting. Um, let's see. Do we want to oh, take yeah. a look at one yeah. of the scenes? Sure. Do you? Oh, yeah, we have the script. Forgot. Yeah, let's just take a look at one or two scenes. I'll, I'll pull it's just it off. such good writing. So I posted the link before. Um, uh, is Logan the antagonist? It's an interesting question. Um, uh, yes. In the show, 100%. Uh, we, though we understand him and we spend time with him. And sometimes I think there are some episodes that feature him. But like if you had to pick an antagonist for the show, it is 100% this father who has terrorized his children. And they are, he is the main, he is the, he is the object of their affection and dreams and also the main obstacle. Like he's the one who messed up their lives. He's the one who's given them this dysfunction. All of the show's dysfunction is caused by him, even if it's like, you know, from their childhood. Mm -hmm. Logan is 100% the antagonist in my opinion. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I just posted a link to the, the pilot script. And Adam, do you want to talk about some initial yes. differences? Yes. Yeah, so so this this is uh, the pilot as it stood in 2016. Um, like it is different. Draft, right? Yes. And it changes. The opening scene is way better in the show. Like it starts with, uh, you guys want to fuck or what? And, <laughs> and in the script here, it's, I get your position, Lawrence. I understand your reservations about our bid and I respect your viewpoint. How different is that line from are you guys ready to fuck or what? Wait, what? I must have found a different draft then because look at the draft I have here. I'm going to steal your link. So there's a few different drafts floating around. Oh, this is around. an earlier draft. Wait, uh, go to page three or scene three, page two. Oh, this is where it started in the, the yeah, other draft? Yeah, this is the scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Whereas we see him, I, and, and whether they, I don't know where they change it, which draft they change it, but it's just interesting to see, like, wow, this is the sixth draft. And um, it's different. They still made changes. They kept pushing it. They kept refining it. They might have had a table read with the actors and sort of felt like, hmm, you know, we need to get to um, Kendall's incompetency faster. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to open with our first impression is that this is not the guy you want running a giant corporation. Yeah, like this one makes him seem kind of legit. If this is if this is the first time that we meet Kendall, it's like 4 a.m. He's clearly been working really, really hard. Um, he's not doing his like big unprofessional thing. He's being yep. pretty, pretty straightforward, a pretty just like reasonable guy. They did a total you know, rewrite for him. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. And then we then we go to Shiv, and Pre-kind, I guess. Do they add Tom in? Yeah, they they give Tom some lines or something. They got rid of this. You know? uh, no set. The yeah. No, it's the same. Say it's this is oh, a pretty similar. It's the same. This is pretty yeah. similar. It's just that they start rearranging scenes and things like that. Um, it's it's interesting. Um, let's see. Did they rewrite a later version, or could that have been an onset change? I don't know. Um, it could have been. Uh, I mean. I know that this uh, came out in like 2018, right? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yeah, you know, let me find this, this particular scene. This goes to show show how many drafts these things go through, even for people who are like established and professional writers. These things shift a lot over time. Um, I like finding earlier drafts where I'm like, ooh, that was an odd voice that they made. And then it gives you a... It reassures you that you can always fix things. You can always you can always make things better. And once you have it on the page, you can improve it. It's always nice. That's, to this is a great scene. This is on page um, forty six of my draft or yours. Both. Really? Oh, I thought we have the same one. Mm -mm. I actually let me see if I can grab yours. I, I sent you the link privately. Yeah. Yeah, I used a different one, and I didn't know it was different. I just assumed it would be the same. Yeah, I know. There are different drafts hanging around. This is how this works. 
but either way, both both are the same writer, and you can learn things from different versions. Um, Forty-eight, you said. Yes, this is the midpoint. Uh, the midpoint scene. Numbered forty-eight at the top, or this. Numbered forty-six, page forty-six. Scene thirty-three. Got it. There. I love you know, how this just focuses on the high impact. Do you want to be Logan? Do you want to read about it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, just read the scene. Really or no, I'll be I'll be Kendall. You be. Okay, sure. Interior right. dining room day. Kendall catches up with Logan. You fucked me. I just changed my mind, Kendall. When? When exactly? Because it feels like you. I had my I had doubts, and then certain things have caused me to rethink. What? Like what? Nothing. It's me. It's mainly me. But you, you're still two years ago. You were still in the clinic. No, they changed that to the nut house. Oof. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> That's a good rewrite. Yeah. Rehab and dad. That makes. It's all good. I'm just worried you might be soft as yet. Are you See, he's so much nicer in this draft. I'm sorry. I'm intercutting. <laughs> no, you're good. Are you kidding? I hear Larry Del Maestro trash talk to you and you let him just come? I was being professional. Are you played weak, conflict diverse. I wasn't about to get into a fucking big dick competition. I hear you bent for him. I what? I hear you bent for him and he fucked you. Well, no. Thing is, you probably read a lot of books about management technique and this and that, but you know what? What? Sometimes it is a big dick competition. That's what it is. So that's it. I should have shouted at some guy, but I didn't. So you've ripped up 18 months of corporate strategy? You're 80, Dad. You can't do it all. Logan shrugs, almost mumble, mumbles. You never lawyered the trust change. You're going to use that against me? I trusted my father. There's a black mark. It's That's a, a black mark? <laughs> it's an accumulation. You left the room. To come to my father's birthday party? We don't know how many more there will be. Logan doesn't like that. Kendall breathes. So come on. When will, when will you be ready to step down? I don't know. Five? Five years? Ten. Ten? Twenty. Twenty? Dad, seriously, for God's sake? Logan has reached the edge of what feels he needs to do to placate. It's my fucking company. Kendall's full of rage now. Yeah, and you're running it into the fucking ground. This is a zombie company, and you're asleep at the wheel. Logan, with eyes that are cold fire, stares him out. Logan. Uh-huh. Kendall tries a new track. You know, this is floated already. There's fucking paps outside. I'm getting asked for a quote. Fuck him. This plays horrible. It plays as humiliation. My profile will be in the toilet. This is fucking Snobageddon. Relax, you're not going to live in a tent in Syria. When the street hears, when the board hears. Yeah, yeah, everything changes. The studio was going to tank when I bought it. Everyone was going to stay home with videotapes. But guess what? No, they want to go out. Everyone told me no one wanted to watch Network, except you make it fucking zing, and they do. You make your own reality. And once you've done it, then apparently... Everyone's of the opinion it was all fucking obvious. Logan walks off and we, so I want to get into some of this. <laughs> yeah. so this little, it, there are some moments that are different, but it's 80% the same scene. Mm -hmm. I love the Kendall tries a new track. Yeah. Where is that? Uh, stop of 43, 49. Yeah. That's it. That's the interesting. Cause like, if you look at this, it's just pretty straight dialogue. And so there's, they do things like that to break up the text. Like this one almost had nothing. And they had Logan shrugs, almost mumbles, which is fine. It just, it lets you know the pace is really fast. And doing things like, like saying he tries a new tack is helpful in first off, just breaking up the look of the page, which matters. And second off, it gives us just a little bit of insight into what's happening. Um, it gives the actor something to go on to be like, okay, that's what he, that's yes. what he's doing. Um, there's so many like narrative action lines that are good. F they're actable. Like mm -hmm. on 48, Logan doesn't like that. Kendall Breeze, but there's so many ways you can play. He doesn't like it, but it's important that he's reacting to the acknowledgement of his mortality. 
Logan mm-hmm. does Logan doesn't like that. Is it's like you can have so many versions that are just like overwrought, like you know, his left eyelid quivers with rage. You know, that's like yeah. a novelistic thing. Screenwriter says Logan doesn't like that. Although that but this it's important to note that this is one of the instances where it breaks the rules, but we like it. Because technically yes, it's subjective. Yeah. Because technically this isn't you can't film not liking it. You can film the expression of it. Um, but this is one of the cases where it really the line. Yeah, it's like it's pretty borderline, and I think it works here because it gives room to play it. Um and it also makes it really clear. Like sometimes when we use lines like this, like Logan doesn't like it, we could have made that conf- we could have made that obvious through action. But if we just said he like folds his arms and like purses his lips, we don't know exactly necessarily what's happening. Like is he just getting madder? But the fact yeah. that he doesn't like it gives us something here. Sometimes people do that with like he's confused. It's like well. We can be pretty reasonably like guaranteed that confusion is expressed in a, like, like that he like blinks or like does something like that. You know, I don't know. I hope so. I actually sense. think this the script really uses subjectivity well. Like it's always when they when he does lines like that, it's always something that's easy to communicate for the actor and the reader. Like it's a really good balance. Like uh, let's go to page one. Let's just read the the first half of the first page. This one? Yeah, you can be Logan. Page one, scene one? Yep. Mm -hmm. Interior room, night, black. The unsteady POV of someone groping through a darkened room. Hands out ahead, bang, a wall. The figure we're following wasn't expecting that. Hands flat against the wall, hand over hand, looking for an opening. Where? Where am I? Wow, stole my line. Sorry. <laughs> it's because it says, where are we next? <laughs> where am I? Where are we? A prison cell? A maze? Where the fuck am I? Okay, here's an opening our figure was seeking. Logan? It's okay, Logan. Our guy is in some is in somewhere now, into the room he was seeking. Okay, everything is okay. He knows what he's doing now. <sighs> okay, okay. Yeah, just right there. This is like really on the edge in terms of like showing unfilmables, but it's it's all oriented. It's all done very simply and elegantly. Where are we? A prison cell? A maze? It reads well, and it shows us the mind's eye of the character. Like it's it's t- breaking the rules technically, the rules, but it's communicating with clarity and um, efficiency. And I the, say it all- so it also does help express what we see on the screen. We don't make it clear. Yeah. Like, we don't know where we are at this point. The camera doesn't literally, like, based, it's telling us that by what we see in the frame on the screen, we don't know where we are yet. We could be in a prison cell. We could be somewhere else. We don't know where we are. This is the the lens's eye of how the scene is going to play out. And at this point in the narrative description, the audience doesn't know where Logan is. Yep. So that that is how that shakes out. I want to pull up this comment from Jack that I think was really interesting. Um, not sure if we have any Shakespeare buffs, but this shows a brilliant homage to and subversion of King Lear. He exiles Cordelia because she won't puff his feathers. Logan exiles Kendall because he will puff his. Yep. Interesting. Yeah, I, I think you can't talk about stories like this without mentioning King Lear because it's so archetypal. It's so, it's so good. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm a, I'm a Shakespeare fan myself, but um, I think stories like that are so influential. They're like, you can't talk about a patriarch who's giving away their empire with very, with, without like touching on those themes. Like it's so well rendered, like people remember, and like there's no, nothing wrong with that. It's great. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I do think Shakespeare is over adapted, but that's just, that's a me problem. Um, yeah, I've heard that. I've heard it said that there's only so many stories that exist in the world, right? Isn't that what they say yeah. about like like there's only so many like loose stories that exist in the world, like like six or seven types of stories is something that was said, and it's like 
love, like trying to get someone to love you, like some like, trying to get something, like trying to yeah, a quest. It's like Monster it's very very house, gen right? yeah, <laughs> it's very very generic, and I can't remember what they are, but it's it's kind of like one of those things where when you are playing in the vein of of this, you're gonna bump into a lot of stuff that's been done before, and as writers sometimes we struggle with, is that okay? Like, is it okay that I have seen this particular idea in this other thing before? Um, it's all and, public domain. <laughs> yeah, it's public domain. And I say yes, because you're going to incidentally run into similar things. Um, it's just having rip, a different... If you're going to rip mm -hmm. off Shakespeare, it's cheap. So <laughs> it's free. There are two types of people. Yep. <laughs> so... I have one I more scene so. I want to read. If oh, you, you do? Okay. Yeah, yeah uh, we'll page see. 70. At the end. Third to last. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the scene where Lawrence uh, and uh, Kendall uh, spar out. I really love the way this is written. You can be Lawrence. Okay. Invest Interior Investment Bank Day. The two gangs, Kendall and Lawrence's, are waiting outside where the independent committee is making a decision. Lawrence takes a call. He looks away, covers the interaction, talks in a phone. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh, that's you. <laughs> I'm, terrible. <laughs> I'm terrible. You know, I want he you to do the do office. It. Do it. Do it. Uh-huh. 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 Thank you. Lawrence ends the call. He takes a breath, closes his eyes, big decision, opens them, turns. Kendall. Kendall heads over. They meet for a whispered conference. You heard? What? Clearly not. Well, I'm suspending our bid. We accept your merger proposal. It's all very exciting. Are, are you serious? Uh-huh. You win. Lawrence nods to his counsel. Will you tell the committee to suspend their deliberations? The management bid is over. Comco wins. We're joining forces. Congratulations. We're a top 10 media company. He shakes Kendall's hand. Fuck yes. Kendall's phone starts going. Second of all, uh, your dad just had a brain hemorrhage. What? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry for you. Are you? Is this? Kendall doesn't know what these words mean. Is it grim trash talk or a mistake or truth or what? Lawrence goes to sit down, but first he leans in. But you just invited me into your chicken coop. Daddy's dying, and I'm going to eat all of you, one by one. Kendall's in shock, answers his phone. Hello? All right, that's that's great. Um, isn't that a good scene? <laughs> the way this right. Lawrence's character just, like, just totally switches. Mm -hmm. It's really good. For I also sure. like, like the line, like setting it up, like the two gangs. Have you heard so what? Clearly not. Yeah. Uh, here is this. Sorry, but maybe you already answered this, but why was the Walter guy at the start such a nervous introvert only to make such a switch? I think that that reminds me of like, what's his name? Mark Zuckerberg, who like people who are like high up at tech companies um, being like awkward and not really <laughs> knowing how to... Uh, how to handle things, but then being absolutely cutthroat. I think it's just like part of that characterization. I think that maybe he, it's possible he was played slightly too soft to make the shift completely work. Um, but I think, I think it's like part of that. It's like, he was just kind of awkward, just like wanting to get out. He didn't see anything more there that could benefit him. He didn't see anything that could like benefit him from the situation. He got his dig in at the beginning of that first conversation. He got to say like the thing. He got to make the drug use comment. He got to say that he's a daddy's boy, and you're not going to come in and wreck my company. <clears throat> so we got hints that he wasn't just nervous and not just like an introvert. Like he kind of he kind of tore into Kendall. Um, so but, I, can I can I comment on yeah, this? Yeah, go you go for it. So I think this is the way I read it. Maybe this is subjective, you know, whatever. But um. I read it as everyone in this world is a good operator except for Kendall. They are all have their two face. Like Logan is two faced when he needs to be. This guy was two faced. The mo he doesn't trash talk until he, until he goes to the elevator. He doesn't trash talk in the room. He's all business. And then he goes in the room. This was kind of a moment like, hey, we did the we did the business. 
and I'm going to tell you what I really think. Whereas Roy, uh, sorry, uh, Kendall is always, he's always himself. Yeah, they were he's, locked in at the end. He, yeah. And <laughs> I, yeah, you could say that it was a Hollywoodized line, but it was extremely effective in the sense of like, it sets up the stakes that it was, set, was an effective antagonist. And, you know, here's the thing, just going to Martine's quote, if we empathize with the Lawrence, why would we empathize with him? Like if we empathize with every single character in the show, I mean, that's a choice, but like, I think it would make, this guy's more of an obstacle and an antagonist than we need. Like yeah. sometimes you just need a character who plays an asshole. Like this story is not about Lawrence. In in uh, Kendall's story, he's an asshole that he has to deal with. But objectively speaking, yeah. he's probably a better person than Kendall is. I mean, I think that, so at some point there, it's the discussion of complexity versus depth right yes and so it's about like you have all these different characters and you only have so much screen time you can only yes. go deep with so many of them and at some point you have to start making choices about who you go deep with right and so lawrence is one of those that doesn't he's not in our core circle of people that we're gonna track yet a lot of times shows will change that over time i don't know what happens here if he just goes away or what but um he uh he's not one of our core ones so here we choose the complexity of adding him over like the depth of like we give him pages but we don't have enough pages to go into depth about his character and we don't have enough like emotional bandwidth to really get into him i will say that i empathize with him a little bit because at the beginning you could tell that these people were douches and he like called yeah. them out he's like you're a daddy's boy i'm not gonna let you come in here and destroy my company i was kind of like well good for you yeah like totally. i'm glad that you don't you don't buy it and then the, and I think that's part of what made the flip so intense is that at first I was like, yeah, you're harsh, but tell them, you know, don't let them act like that to you. And then, and then he flipped it. Because if you actually look at it objectively, if you didn't, if we didn't have all those scenes of vulnerability with Kendall crying in front of his father, beating, blowing, beating up the bathroom, like being frustrated about not connecting with his family, all that stuff, if we didn't have all that, um, he's the asshole in the situation. Lawrence is completely justified. Like he said no, and the guy just keeps throwing money at him. He's a t he's totally tone deaf to the situation. Like Lawrence is not the asshole because it's Kendall's story. Lawrence is the asshole. So like yeah. all of these decisions, like you said, complexity versus depth. You have to make decisions as a storyteller sometimes to do to to you have sometimes decision kind of like a scaffolding decision. You have to do something kind of like okay to make the story work. Like not every piece of scaffolding in a story is going to be absolute brilliance. It's sometimes you have to build a normal piece of like, you know, and sometimes you build a support pillar to make the building work. And like this character was a support pillar to make the scene work. Like they served a function to reveal Kendall's character. Everyone is just being drama, brilliant, David Mamet writing all the time, all day, every day. Sometimes it would like compromise maybe having a plot that's succinct and runs quickly and is effective and communicates. There's things you have to do yeah. as a storyteller to just make things work sometimes. Yeah, I would say that there's a valid version of this story where if you wanted Kendall to be a main character, you would have to step back on someone else, but we could have him as like some sort of like recovering antagonist and choose to go there. But the story that has been, that we've chosen to tell in this case has, has uh, not Kendall, Lawrence on the periphery. Uh, yeah. He's just, he, like, he's just not core to the story, so we get less of him. And I'd say that despite that, they did about as good of a job as you can do at creating a character that had some dynamics to him that would be fun for an actor to play, which is like, you know, ends of the line stuff, but still things you want to consider. Like, this guy is... If this guy only has this role in this episode and then he's out, how do you make someone want to play that role? Like, how do you give actors something good to work with? Um, and I think that this one has the, the two-face element that is really interesting yeah. to people. I want to talk about this comment here because I have a hot take for this hot take, which is, I agree completely, but... <laughs> I don't think there are stories that exist that don't have contrived elements. Like yeah. all stories are contrived. They like, it's not all just organic 
drama, organic creation. It's yeah, there's there, there's that stuff that is like really exciting that like just comes out that characters talking to each other, making choices. But then there's like the contrived scaffolding. Like sometimes you have to make a plot decision to justify the fact that it's a television show and you need a strong season ender. And mm -hmm. it's the best choice given the situation. Like I don't, I've never watched a television show that didn't have contrived plot elements or choices. And sometimes yeah. it's like, yeah, they could have thought of something better. And, but a lot of the time it's just like, yeah, they kind of had to do that to get where they wanted to go. Like I've I never seen that a story that's not contrived. <laughs> you can do something to make it, I think that ways to get around it being contrived. And again, I haven't seen the season, so I don't know if they do this, but like is laying in little breadcrumbs yeah. that he has made very, very poor decisions while high, like he might have like driven while high or something, or like that his car is that he like isn't a good driver, that like maybe his car needs to be fixed and he keeps not handling it something you know things like that you could leave little breadcrumbs so that these things that feel contrived feel earned and i think that that's the important thing about introducing contrived elements script like the whole thing's going to be contrived but do you earn it yeah and like does it and it, if you leave these crumbs and build to it so that when we're like oh uh, okay it makes sense that we were pointing here i think that that's when the the contrived things work because sometimes be, uh, a contrived design can be a feature, not a bug, right? Like, mm -hmm. like the, what we're really talking about is what in terms of what matters is does it communicate, and does it like work? Like, if yeah. it takes you out of the experience, like a Deus Ex Machina is the ultimate contri contrivance, right? It's well, uh, I couldn't think of a way for the characters to get their way out of this, so I'm just going to have a thing save them at the end. Um, yeah, but you know. Would have Lord of the Rings been emotionally satisfying if Frodo and Sam died in the volcano? Because technically, it was a Deus Ex Machina. Yeah, the Eagles came and saved them, but it wouldn't have been emotionally satisfying if they died. You know, given the, yeah. like that was a completely contrived decision. There are a lot of plot. There are a lot of plot decisions. People, it it, it comes down to does this work? Does this communicate? How does the average person, who's the, or I should say, how is the desired audience reacting to this? Because mm -hmm. the average person who watches Succession is not a writer analyzing it. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, like with the Eagles, I don't know. I don't even remember this thing more, but like do they lay in anything about the Eagles beforehand. Like, does it feel earned at all? Cause I feel like there is like validity to pushing back on if it doesn't feel earned then it doesn't feel earned and like contrived, everything is contrived, but you never want to feel the writer's hand. Yeah. Like, you know, you don't want to feel like you don't want to break the fourth wall and or like, you know, ruin the immersion. Um, if like, that's not the style that you're going for. If, if you're doing Fleabag, then yeah. But like, this isn't Fleabag. And if it broke the immersion and it made you see the writer's hand in this case, then that means that it's not working for you and that maybe they should have done more to earn it, which is completely fine. I guarantee there are things that are not perfect about the script, even though it's, I think, worth looking at. And honestly, identifying those things and being like, maybe they should have earned it more. Maybe they should have laid a few more quick, easy lines about stuff like that throughout the season to yeah. make us aware that this is something that is plausible. Um, also, I think Deus Ex Machina is less detectable when it's a bad thing. If it's something that makes the situation worse. So like in the, yeah. uh, in the, in the example of the car accident, yeah, it, it did, it was a way for the writers to reset things and to get themselves out of a hole, but it was a bad thing for the, like it, the audience doesn't feel cheated unless it's the problem it's of the show is solved because of reasons that have nothing to do with the agency of the characters. Like because like it's, it's a bad thing. Win. Yes, yeah. if it's an unearned win, that's when people feel cheated. And at the end of the day, a Deus Ex Machina is only bad when the when the audience feels cheated, from my mm -hmm. opinion. That's just me. Yeah. So it's, yeah, I think people get away a lot more with random bad events than, you know, like Adam was saying, random wins. Because we want to see people earn their win. <laughs> and we want to see all the pieces come together. And it's like, it makes it feel like you just watch something worthwhile. 
Um, but like, there's a lot of sudden intense complications that happen at the final fight. Like the, in the third act of the film, there's almost always a, uh, a something because we say that there's an unexpected no there's a something failure what do we call it the unexpected it, uh, uh failure or oh, unexpected success yeah what was the fit we call the failure something else like oh something oh a catastrophic failure catastrophic failure yeah in the beginning of the final fight the protagonist goes into the fight and right out of the gate there's almost always a catastrophic failure and a lot of times that can feel like um can technically have been something that comes out of nowhere. Like that is like all of a sudden the boss levels up, you know, like now yeah. he brings out his big cannons and we didn't expect that. And this is going to be terrible. And that just makes it feel better in the end when they win. Um, so we kind also, of go with it for the most part. If Logan is the antagonist, a deus ex machina for him is a, is a, it's just, it's just a bad thing for the characters, right? Like it's just something that makes things worse. Um, mm -hmm. And this is true. Yeah. Sometimes, it would have been a producer note. Yeah. Sometimes those a are there and the writers bad can't help it. Especially in Marvel movies, like the, the bad ones or the not as good ones, I should say. Um, you can just tell it's just like studio notes cluttering up what the writers and actors. Wait, are. Wait, gave the infamous one about the quiet place. Oh, yeah. The, the board about like the yeah. monsters can, <laughs> can, you know, can hear you. It's sort of like, yeah, we got that, dude. You don't need to have yeah. it written on the wall as we the camera pans, you know. Like the writer clearly set up the fact that this is going to be like we understand by this point that they can't make a sound. And then on the board, yeah. some producer said, no, 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 write it out and circle it in red that uh, you can't make a sound just to make sure we're yeah. hitting it over it's the just... head. <laughs> I think I yeah. think you're OK in terms of this, like if you're making decisions if the decisions you're making are like about keeping your protagonist like as the center of agency for their destiny, like whatever Kendall does, whatever Kendall's ultimate successes or failures are, they should feel like they are a consequence of his actions and his choices. And the moment that's not the case and it's outside of his choices, that's when people feel cheated. That's a good point about Murphy's Law. We all have yeah. like, you know, who often does a random thing save your day? And how often does a random thing ruin it? That's right. That's know? right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> we are more likely to believe the random bad thing. Also, this is a gray thing. area. Like, yeah. There's there's no like objective correct stance on this. Like we're talking about a television show that has a certain design principle and expectation and like media consumption context. It's designed to achieve a certain effect, and all of its choices come from that. Like. I think it's just important to remember that like this is art and craft within yeah. a commercial context. Like sometimes yeah. it can be like, Oh, we're talking about like, you know, artists, like if you're just making decision, if you're making writer decisions in your story to impress other writers, you're fucked. Yeah. Like I always think remember that there's an audience. <laughs> there's like, when we talk about these things like structure and character and things like that, there's a bunch of different things that play. Some of that is commercialization, like what the industry expects and like what people at home in, or like in your audience expect. There's also psychology, just like human psychology and how people interact. That's another factor. There's limits of the, of the form. So like you have an hour for the story and you have to make a story work within an hour, which means that you will tend to have certain things happen at certain points. Like you will tend to have a midpoint just because of the, of the form what has worked historically and then you also just have like on top of that i like your own tastes as a writer um you have the history of what has gone over well you have all of these different things at play that doesn't necessarily mean something is good or bad doesn't necessarily have a charge to it but it's all these just like things getting at the loose organic structure of a story and so it's it's a lot to consider and a lot to think about, but it's not supposed to be a law. Sometimes we talk about it and we just like, we have to make sure to emphasize that it's not hard rules. It's just, this is what's happening here and this is why it works or why it doesn't in this particular case. And that's, I don't know, I feel like that's the benefit of analyzing things. It's just looking at yeah. 
cases. I think the only benefit to analyzing is to like learning how to make your own work work. Yeah. If, if you're not able to like, when I say work, I, I mean like produce the effect on an audience or reader mm -hmm. to communicate, to make, and what I mean communicate, I mean like effectively show the empathy of the characters and take you on that journey, right? Like the roller coaster ride of the script. Not every choice is like, I, I'm, re I'm repeating myself, but like, I really think it's important to like think in the framework of, oh, how do I make this work to communicate with an audience? Yeah. How can I surprise an audience? How can I be compelling? Um, because if you're making decisions from like the point of view of like, oh, that's not, that's contrived or though that's not artistically interesting, you may be right, but you could also make a bad decision because you're trying not to be contrived. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Sometimes you have yeah. to be to make something work. Yeah. It's a, it's a tough balance, but it's fun. And I guess that's, that's the whole thing about being a writer. If this kind of thing is fun for you, then you are set. If you like yeah. thinking about human <laughs> psychology and like communicating with people and like, how do you express these things and how do you get this conflict out and how do you create tension? If these are the things that you like thinking about, then fantastic. You will never stop thinking about them. It isn't like There's you learn it once and then it is set. You know, that's right. <laughs> There's a lot of like left brain stuff in playwriting and screenwriting. And I think that kind of surprises a lot of people. I, th I think all writing, but like there's a lot of left brain design, craft, construction, analysis brain that is really, really, really useful. Like if you're just sitting there pouring your hearts out, letting the characters talk to each other, you know, without taking design and craft and editing into consideration, you're never going to sell anything because you're not never going to be able to com to create material that communicates in a commercial format or it's going to be harder. That kind of thing works better for novels where yes, that's true. where you are the you are the end product, right? Where this is you, you might get an editor's notes on your thing, but then this is what you show people. Uh, screenplay is not that. The only people who tend to look at screenplays are other screenwriters. That's and right. like <laughs> you know? that's <laughs> yeah, so or, it's or like, agents and producers, you know, like who, agents, like, producer, yeah. But after people on the back done, end, yeah. Nobody, everybody watches the film. Nobody reads the screenplay unless you're trying to learn, like you said. Yeah, it's all back end stuff, and so it's important to, yeah, to consider its role as a blueprint. Cool. So I think so, that we're that's at it. time. Yeah. So next week we are doing the pilot of the Expanse which I'm going to break down and I am super, super stoked about it because I love this show. I, I have only seen the first eight episodes. No, I saw the first two seasons and I read the books and mm. I loved the show. So I should watch the rest of it. God, it's <laughs> but so the good. books are so good. I need to read you know, the books too. They're really good. They're really good, Alexi. They're, I think they're more interesting. Like the world building is communicated in a very good way that's based in character and all that stuff. But you want to know a fun fact? Um, it's two people wrote the books together. One guy handles the drama and the writing, the character stuff, and the other does the world building and technical sci-fi stuff. So they've really, divided in context. Yeah. yeah sorry. It's like, it's really, no, 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 exactly. And I think that that shows because like, I, I wrote a Mars script and it was animated, but when I write things, they fall down the rabbit hole. And I did a ton of research on like what we expect it to be like when we're able to travel further distances and like what we expect it to be like on life on Mars and like all these different things about like what we expect with space travel. And I was like pretty shocked by how much of what they're doing exactly lines up with like really intense considerations about keeping it grounded what would this realistically be like like if we realistically were settled in earth mars and the asteroid belt and we had been there for a few like decades what kind of cultures would emerge like what kind of trends would emerge like what problems would emerge and all of these really really interestingly expressed things and i think that they do an excellent job balancing um the complexity of that with just character work because it's easy to favor one or the other and i think that they i'd say they handle it 
in a way that I think is like ideal in terms of balancing this complex political grounded sci-fi world with pushing it to a little bit more of exciting of a place and then putting people in it that feel interesting and real. Um, For sure. Um, it also looks great. <laughs> Very <yeah>. shallow. <laughs> it's, a, it's, I think, the most, it's the best looking, technically, sci-fi show I've ever seen. Um, yeah. And fun fact, one more fun fact. One of the, t one of the writers was, um, of the of the book was George R. R. Martin's assistant for years. Well, there you go. So he got this really meaty uh, quote on the back cover that really helped him. Um, That's interesting. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a great show, great characters. What I love about it too is that like when you ask people what their favorite character is, they have characters that they really, really like and people yeah. will actually give you different answers. Like, yeah, they have good, multiple good answers. Yeah. It's a great show, and I hope you all like it as much as I do. Um, and yeah, Martine, you know, if uh, if you're a psychopath, <laughs> it's going to be a little tougher. <laughs> it's going to be a little tougher, not going to lie. Um, it's still possible. I'm sh there are many successful screenwriters uh, or people who can write great screenplays who are uh, terrible human beings with very low empathy. So yeah. um, there's many successful psychopaths too. So yeah. there's they make great surgeons. There you go. Yeah. CEO. Oh, sorry, sociopaths. I should say. <laughs> you know, my favorite depiction of a sociopath in television is Dennis from It's Always Sunny. Like that, he he is such a sociopath, and they keep like they've been teasing out that he's like basically like a like a psychotic killer, like as a side joke. Like why have all these zip ties in your in your backseat of your car. Uh, don't, don't ask a man about his tools. You're like, wait, what? <laughs> and it's like all these low key jokes that are just so funny. And like the way he makes decisions, it's it's a cartoonish uh, representation, but it's very good. I'm trying to sell Alexi on It's Always Sunny. Maybe we'll get there one day. Maybe it's one funny. Day. It's a funny show. <laughs> all right. Let's, all right. Thank uh, you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah.